And joining us now on the line from New York, New York, John Rady. He is the author of a new book called Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise and the Brain. And John, it's good of you to join us tonight. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. It's great to be with you. You're obviously doing your exercising if you're fine. And let's pick up right on that, the theory that you have espoused now. Uh, obviously, uh, it's good for the heart. It's good for shaving a few extra pounds off for people to exercise. But this notion of having kids exercise because it's good for the brain is new. What do you want to tell us? Exercise optimizes brain function in three different ways. First, it makes the learner ready to learn. It puts them in the chair. It decreases their nudginess improves their attention, decreases their stress levels and anxiety, improves their motivation, and helps them try things that they might not have tried before. That's one. The second thing is that it creates what we call the microenvironment or the environment within our brains where our 100 billion nerve cells are swimming around, uh, enriches that uh, environment and, uh, uh, with all kinds of nutrients and neurotransmitters that make our brain cells uh, in an optimal way uh, ready to do what they're supposed to do when we learn, which is to change. Uh, when we learn anything, we have to encode it. We have to have our brains change in response to practice, in response to learning. And the third thing that exercise does is that it promotes the uh, growth of brand new brain cells in our brain. We have uh, learned in the past 10 or 15 years that we humans, too, have stem cells in all of our organs, including our brains. And one <clears throat> pocket in particular is near the hippocampus or the memory station, uh, central station for our brain. And exercise promotes our cells to change and be become brand new nerve cells, uh, better than anything else that we know of. But what about the sedentary lifestyle affecting our ability actually to learn? Talk to me about that. Well, there's a, in a couple ways. One, one is that it decreases our physical movement, which has an impact on our, our brain uh, readiness to learn. It also uh, promotes us to gain weight. And when we begin to gain weight, uh, it puts taxes our, our brains uh, a little more. It, and as we age, we get uh, more glucose and fat in our bloodstream and this causes sluggishness in our brain cells and eventual uh, cognitive decline and, and even Alzheimer's disease. So would you say that so, young people today who overdo it on the video games and lead too sedentary a lifestyle are not as intelligent as those from a couple of generations ago? Well, it's sort of not, not as intelligent. It's not about intelligence because it's so hard to measure and it's so, con uh, you know, con uh, So what's the right adjective this? then? Well, I, th I think that they're not as ready to learn as they might, hmm. might be um, with uh, a proper diet of uh, exercise and play. So l let me just pull a scenario out of thin air here. Um, 25 kids in a class, uh, grade 8, they're 13 years old. What kind of exercise and f how much exercise would you like to see them during, do during the course of that school day to make them able to learn better? Well, the ideal, of course, would be to, to break it up. Uh, because the brain changes uh, very acutely, uh, very quickly, with uh, a little bit of exercise, 10 to 15 minutes of exercise, uh, because we release all these neurotransmitters and, uh, and make uh, our attention system and our motivation system better. Um, and, but that wears off after a while. But the ideal is uh, probably 30 to 40 minutes of pretty intense exercise every day, moderately intense exercise, getting your heart rate up to about 75 to 80 percent of your maximum heart rate. So you, that, 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 means more than just, that means more than just pushing the desks aside and running around in circles, I guess. You really got to get outside for that, don't you? Well, you got to get outside or you got to get in the gym. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the uh, 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 countries that is uh, the model in the European Union is Finland. And the Finns, uh, in terms of the, the model, because they're performing at the highest level academically and on all the tests, uh, and everybody's interested in what they're doing. Well, what they're doing is they're having their classes an hour long, 45 minutes they're taking the instruction, and 15 minutes in between they're either playing 
or they're exercising. They're and outside or uh, running around. They're doing just what you suggested. Okay, in terms and of the type of exercise then, John, would you say what's better? Uh, for example, a treadmill for 45 minutes or something with a lot of fits and starts, squash, hockey, that kind of thing? Oh, I think the squash hockey is probably better uh, if the person is moving all the time uh, because it, it, the change-up is, is very important. A little bit of the sprints here, a little bit of sprints there, moving your body in different uh, dimensions is really good. Uh, but the treadmill will do uh, to get your heart rate up, certainly. And uh, if you're playing squash, which I used to three times a week, um, I'm telling you, you don't notice, but your heart rate is up to uh, near maximum a, a lot of that time. And that's why you look so good, John. I, I think that's what it's, it's been. It's, I, I'm a personal testament to that. <laughs> Tell me, is there a, a best time of the day in which to do this 45 minutes of exercise that you just described? Uh, there really uh, isn't uh, any documentation, but it's just uh, it just makes sense that the earlier in the day, the better, because it does help people wake up. It certainly helps children wake up uh, to get them moving early, as early as possible in the day. A lot of schools start off the day with uh, 30 minutes of intense games or exercise that gets everybody involved. The trick here is to get everybody involved. Most of the time, when we talk about physical education classes, for instance, a lot of it is spent uh, choosing up sides and waiting around for your turn and not moving. Uh, now the, the new PE or the new physical education model is to get everybody moving all the time during those uh, precious minutes that they have. There have been uh, a lot of um, a lot of stories told about a school in Chicago called Naperville Central High, and I would like it if you would tell our viewers about what happened at that school that was so special as it relates to what we're talking about tonight. Well, what happened is that uh, over the past 20 years, there evolved uh, because of some real visionary PE teachers or phys ed teachers uh, evolved a program that is really second to none in the world, I would say where they have uh, the children all competing against themselves with the aid of heart rate monitors. Um, and they've evolved to this. They certainly didn't start off in this way. And they uh, took sports out initially because they realized that kids, all the kids weren't getting as fit. Uh, and the people that really didn't need PE were the ones who were always scoring the highest or running the fastest or the longest. So they evolved this program uh, where now they, they threw sports back in, and now they have small-sided sports where it's two-on-two, three-on-three. You don't choose up sides. Everybody is uh, assigned an, a new team every day, and they get with it, um, and they're, they're always moving. Now, what was fascinating, and when I learned about this school in 2002, 3% of their uh, children were overweight. And this is in a school district of 19,000 kids. It's not just the, the high school, which is only 3,500 kids. But 19,000 kids, 3% were overweight. The national average in the U.S. at that time and now is 33%. Hmm. What really got me, though, was not just their, their physical fitness, or so it seemed, but the fact that that year they took the international science and math test which is a test that the U.S. and other uh, countries take every three years or so. And in the U.S., we score in the teens somewhere in science and math when uh, schools from um, or countries uh, like Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan are always in the top five. Well, that year, Naperville had 90, almost 99 percent of their kids take the, this test and they scored number one in the world in science and number six in math. And how do you know you can draw a straight line between the exercise that th these students do and those higher test scores, lower obesity rates, et cetera? Well, certainly the lower obesity rates, uh, one, can, one can certainly see that uh, because that's a necessary ingredient in helping us uh, maintain uh, a reasonable weight. You can't draw a straight line uh, unless you do c c studies, but a lot of studies have now been done on lots of different populations showing that if you do exercise, let's say for 20 minutes on a treadmill, uh, and you do it in, not even in a moderate way, but just walking, kids uh, uh, in grade eight, let's say, uh, they, they had them walk for 20 minutes, they scored 10 
to 15% better after they had their walk than uh, this, the same group before. Um, and so that they were, Im they improved their ability to take the test. Any noticeable just, changes in behavior problems? Oh, that's the biggest uh, issue that, and the, the biggest bonus that we've seen. Naperville is a, an upper middle class area, uh, but when they've taken this program now into other school districts in Kansas City and Charleston, South Carolina, the first thing that we see in the first four months of, of switching into an everyday program where the kids are moving, all the kids are moving all day long, uh, or 45 minutes a day, mm -hmm. they see a tremendous plunge in disciplinary problems. In Kansas City, they saw a 63% drop in the uh, elementary school in the first year. In Charleston, South Carolina, an 83% <laughs> drop in the first four months compared year to year. And no question in, in your mind that you would make the direct connection between increased exercise and fewer behavior problems? And no question in my mind at all. No my, question. My, many, many years I've studied problems with aggression and, and attention, and I know that it's, it's a powerful way of, of dealing with both uh, of those problems. How about girls and boys? Are they affected uh, in the same way by this added exercise regimen? Well, the girls actually get a little more bang for their buck than the boys do in many of the measures that are done. Um, but uh, the boys a little more cognitively, girls a lot more with mood and anxiety. Part of that is because it helps uh, regulate in some ways the hormonal changes that girls uh, have such a, uh, often have such a difficult time with. Um, and certainly later in life, uh, women tend to, tend to really need to exercise more than men do in, in, in many ways. Hmm. If, for example, you were a student with attention deficit disorder, of which there are, as we know, many, many more diagnoses today, with this kind of exercise regimen that you're talking about, would you imagine that it would be possible to go off your medication entirely? Oh, so I've, in a chapter of my book on uh, 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 just addresses that. There, there are a number of people that I've had who, when they begun, began to exercise in a, in a fairly vigorous way uh, every day, they were able to reduce their medicine, certainly, and re reduce their dependence on it, and some off of it completely. Hmm. Um, but that's not going to be for every, every child, that's for sure. Uh, but it certainly has always been one of our recommendations as a, as a treatment uh, modality, uh, along with medication, coaching, the structure, and all the uh, organizational changes that go along with treating ADD. But I presume there are some schools that will hear this information and they will say to you, we just can't do this. What are the excuses they give you or the rationales they give you for not being able to do it? Oh, there's, there's tons of them. I mean, it, with the elementary school kids, uh, they, the teachers are afraid uh, that the kids get too exuberant. So that's why they take away a recess. Or the tag is a sexual assault. Or they're afraid of the children being injured. Uh, so they're keeping the kids down. Or they're misbehaving. And so they punish them by uh, keeping them in from recess when that's actually what they need. Um, and that's just in the elementary school programs. But in, in later years, uh, they say, well, they need their time to uh, be sitting in the classroom, taking in all the new information that's out there, uh, and as test scores have been trending downward, and we've been getting further and further behind the rest of the world, uh, more effort is put in by the teachers of the traditional classes to jam it more in and they need that time and people are very envious of, of taking any bit of time away from the science, math, uh, history, English uh, model. Now I wonder if you could help us with one of the most um, oft-repeated stereotypes about school which is you know the kids who play football or the kids who are on the hockey teams are the best athletes but they're the dumbest, you know the dumb jock thing. If, if what you're telling us is right and then, in fact, exercise promotes a better ability to learn. Do we have to get over this notion of dumb jock? Well, there's two parts to it. One, one is that doing the exercises that they do, if they are playing all the time, uh, is going to make them more ready to learn, is going to make them more ready to, be, to take in the information, to process it, to perform better. But they have to want to. And, and also, they have to, they have to apply themselves. And they may uh, have other 
uh, cognitive problems and uh, problems that we're unaware of that uh, keep them from doing that. But it usually is a matter that the stars certainly are not that interested in school. And they uh, get a free pass in many of, of the, the academic uh, requirements. And so they end up being dumb jocks. But there are many, many sports where those kids who participate in it do much better because they're members of a team that demand a lot of uh, uh, intense exercise and training. And the flip side of that would be, why does it always seem that the smartest kids in school are the ones who look, how do I put this gently, the nerdiest and look like they have never seen a pair of running shoes in their lives? Well, uh, that's not necessarily true. I mean, you put, you put those nerds into running shoes and you get them moving uh, along with everybody else and not make it uh, an issue of who's the best, but how you can attain your personal best, those nerds do better. Okay, John, let me ask you one last thing about this, and that is, uh, for the younger generation, for those who are in high school, let's say, uh, it could be a pretty tough sell to say to them, and first of all, you know, to be at school at 8.30 in the morning is already a tough sell for a teenager, but to say, get into school at 8.30, and then we're gonna exercise you for 45 minutes before you start doing math, English, and physics, is that too tough a sell? It may be, and it, it takes time to establish that kind of culture, but I think it's something that really, once we, be, once we begin to see one school flip after another uh, and, and, and show that this is something that is valuable uh, and realize that, I think then, then it becomes part of, just part of the routine. The book, once again, is called Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise and the Brain. John Rady, good of you to join us on the line from New York tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.